going to read you something from the book of Luke, chapter 17, starting at verse 11. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Leprosy. Very nasty disease. I've seen it up close and personal when I worked in Romania. And in case you didn't think we have leprosy in Europe, there's more than a hundred cases a year right here in the UK. So one time in Romania, I've ended up in what I suppose you call a leper colony. That's the thing about responding to God and trying to help people. You can end up anywhere. And I've been shown around this place. I remember this little boy came up to me about eight years old, I guess. He looked me straight in the eye, a sort of pleading look, and extended his hand. His fingers on both hands had been eaten away. There was this little hand, and on the end of the hand there were stumps where his fingers should have been. Not a good start to life for this little boy. I rooted in my pocket and found a candy bar. I held it out to him. His hand did not move towards it. His pleading eyes remained fixed upon mine. I put the candy away, took hold of the stump of his hand and continued my tour of the facility. I was still holding his hand when I eventually had to leave. I wondered about this little boy on the long drive back. I wondered how often he had yearned for affection, for the touch of another human being, for someone who wouldn't reject the plea in his eyes and the outstretched hand. I wondered how many times he had felt that cold slap of rejection, how many tears he had shed. Eight years old. And the longing of his little heart was that someone, anyone, would overcome their fear and their revulsion and actually allow him to experience human contact. I still think of him from time to time. I think of him when I allow myself to fret about the inconsequential little problems that occasionally surface in my otherwise comfortable life. I think of him and those thoughts ground me in the reality of my own situation and the goodness and mercy of God towards me. And I think of all those other people who metaphorically extend their brokenness towards me as he did, inviting me challenging me to take them by the hand. I see their pleading eyes, those who have been ravaged by life, those who are desperate for someone who will help them feel whole, if only for a moment. And I know I must respond to those pleading eyes because they only reflect the silent plea of my saviour who expects me to do what I can for them. I'm sure of this. If by my inaction, I allow that pleading look to become an accusing stare, that will also be shared by Christ 
when I fail them, I fail him. So do you. And that's why, as we come out of this lockdown, we, as a fellowship, must begin effectively connecting with those who have needs. The spiritually destitute, the poor, the disadvantaged, they need us to bring them the hope of Jesus, the gospel for sure, but also the practical outworking of his love. And we need to start grasping the deformed stumps of their lives. We need to hold on. We need to walk with them. We have a God-given mission. And it's time to get on with it. Maybe you think you've got nothing to offer. Perhaps you have wounds of your own or you, or you struggle with sin or, or you can't see what you could bring to the lives of others. A lot of people feel that way. And such people, generally, they do little in church and even less outside of it. If that's you, I've got something to tell you. Jesus isn't buying it just because you are. He doesn't subscribe to your theory that you have nothing to offer because that is not how he created you. You won't avoid his accusing stare by effectively telling him he's misunderstood your situation. He knows your situation perfectly. And he's still calling you to serve. But just in case you still think it's okay to take a back seat because of whatever inadequacies or handicaps you think absolve you from service, here's a challenge for you. Look through the Bible. Look at all the people who served God back then. Look, look at the Old Testament. Moses, Abraham, David, Elijah. Look at Nehemiah, Esther. Look at any of them. Turn to the New Testament, Peter, Paul, James, John, Matthew, and ask yourself this. Did any of these people have any potential of themselves when God called them? Did they bring anything to the party other than faith and obedience? Of course they didn't. Every time, the process was exactly the same. They chose to obey God in faith and he empowered them to make a difference. We're all called to make a difference. Question is, are we going to respond to God in faith and obedience? Or are we going to focus on our shortcomings and lack of natural abilities and tell God he's wrong to expect anything from us? Listen, the fact that you can't naturally string a sentence together will not stop you sharing the gospel. The fact that you are poor will not stop you helping the poor. The wounds of the past will not prevent you from binding up the brokenhearted. What will stop you is if you're arrogant enough to presume that your current inabilities preclude God from using you. Nobody. Nobody is asking you to have faith in yourself. I have no faith whatsoever in my abilities, none at all. I just have faith in God and in his desire to use my life. I have faith in the fact that whatever he wants me to do, he's going to empower me to do it. We live by faith. We don't live by sight. There are three types of people when it comes to that, when it comes to living by faith and not by sight. There are those who balk at it and, and they lose the blessing they would otherwise enjoy. Famously, those first disciples were once in that place. Classic invitation to step out in faith and engage in the miraculous in Christ's power, but they just couldn't bring themselves to do it. Matthew 14, 15 to 16. As evening approached, the disciples came and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy some food. Jesus replied, 
they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. You've got no food for 5,000 people. You've got nothing to offer, but feed them anyway. The subtext is, step out in faith, allow my power to work through you, and you'll have an amazing story to tell your grandkids. People will read about what you did today for thousands of years. All you've got to do is show a little faith. But Jesus ended up doing it himself, didn't he? Guess what? Next time he gives you the opportunity to step out in faith and help someone, he'll be relying on you to be relying on him. He won't be around physically to pick up the pieces if you fail him. Type 2 comes from exactly the same chapter. Someone initially stepping out in faith, but then allowing the circumstances to overcome them. Someone who begins to live by faith, but then chooses to live by sight. Matthew 14 from 31. Shortly before Jesus went out to them walking on the lake, when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come out onto the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? So this is Peter snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. He had faith to step out the boat. But then he allowed his circumstances to overcome him. He started living by sight again. And yeah, it's true, defying the scientific laws of water displacement is an unusual situation in which to find oneself. But if you got the faith to get into that situation, shouldn't you really have the faith to keep trusting God rather than looking at your circumstances? When I found myself in a leper colony, that was a bit of an odd situation for me. It was faith that brought me there, but then I'm looking for what God expects from me. I'm not worrying about my circumstances, uh, and when a leprous hand is searching for mine, I take it. Yes, I know, it's a contagious disease, but if I catch it, it's not my problem, it's God's problem. If Peter sinks beneath the waves, that's God's problem. But because Peter thought it was his problem and he took his eyes off Jesus, the thing he feared most began to happen. He defeated himself. In 1933, Franklin Delano Roosevelt stood outside the Capitol building in Washington and delivered his inaugural presidential address. And he said this, he said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Now, that may be true in politics, but it is certainly true in Christianity. Fear is the opposite of faith. It is debilitating. It eats away at our usefulness to God and it stops us functioning as we should. It is spiritual leprosy. The third type, of course, features those people who live by faith and not by sight. The people whose only asset is their trust in God, but do what he says anyway. Now, I could cite any number of biblical examples where people have started to obey God despite what they could see, only to find that God meets their needs as they respond to him. But I'm going to stick 
with an example which has already come up, those lepers. Just to refresh your memories, here's a snippet. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Hmm. Go show yourselves to the priests. Standard practice, actually, for someone whose disease has previously made them an outcast from Jewish religious society. Not that anyone ever recovered from leprosy without divine intervention. But get this. And as they went, they were cleansed. They are told by Christ to report a healing which at that time had not taken place. They were not healed during the conversation with Jesus. They were, on, they were healed on their way to, to the priest to report an event which had not yet occurred. Jesus was telling them to act on their faith, not on what they could see. And they did it, didn't they? They were equipped for the task they were called to do even as they went to do it. When they stepped away from Christ and walked towards the priest, there was, there was no physical sign they would have anything to say to them. But as they acted in faith, Christ gave them what they needed. Is it any wonder that a God like that doesn't want to hear lame excuses as to why we can't engage with others with love and meet their needs. Is it? Is it surprising? Any wonder? Does he want us to tell him how we lack confidence in sharing the gospel? Or, or we lack resources to, to help the poor? Or, or we're not good listeners for those with breaking hearts? Does he want us to tell him how the wounds inflicted on our lives preclude us from healing the wounds of others? Does he? Or would he rather be saying to us exactly what he said to the leper who returned to thank him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. Because you can be very sure of this, if God doesn't heal our wounds as we come alongside others, they will either cease to be the burden that they once were or that we'll rejoice in the empathy that they give us for those who continue to suffer. I want to close with a few thoughts on another scripture. This one's John 6, 28, 29. It says this, Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this to believe in the one he has sent. Now, this scripture doesn't spell out for us the works God will enable us to do. They're just details of our primary role, which is to believe in Jesus. Everything else we do and, and how well we do it is contingent on that alone, having faith in Jesus. We can do nothing worthwhile without it, and it gives value to even the smallest thing we do in faith. Nothing is impossible for those who believe, but those who don't believe are severely restricted. But genuine faith, genuine faith, presupposes a willingness, even an eagerness, to walk away from the limitations we impose upon ourselves and those thrust upon us by others. Believing in the one he sent means living by faith and not sight. It means trusting him and not our circumstances. There is no reason why we can't live like that and every reason why we should. May we pray. Heavenly Father, it's just such a privilege to be part of your family, such a, a joy to be your, your hands and feet. But please, Lord, help us to live daily in the reality of that, in the reality of our relationship with you. Help us to have the courage 
to step out in faith. Help us overcome any negative self-image or hurts which we have allowed to bind us, Lord. Encourage us as we look for opportunities to, to step out in faith. And Father, give us your sense of urgency to help the broken and the damaged and the despairing. Give us both your love for them and your power to help them. In Jesus' name. Amen.